Welcome to today's webinar, how, how can incorporating social accountability into SBC improve equity and address social determinants of health? We're very excited to have you all join us today to learn more about how social and behavior change programming can leverage social accountability principles, approaches, and strategies to address and shift power dynamics and unequal resource distribution as obstacles to addressing equity and social determinants of health that shape and influence family planning and reproductive health outcomes. Next slide, please. We have a very packed agenda for today. I'm going to kick things over to my colleague, Telesfor Cabore, who will provide an introduction and overview of social accountability. And then we'll go directly into our main event, which is a panel discussion that will be led by Rachel Taylor with Save the Children. We have wonderful panelists representing different African countries um, who have so much depth of experience and expertise in social accountability. And it'll be really wonderful to hear from them about their work and learnings. And then we'll close out once more with my colleague, Telesfor Cabore. Next slide, please. This event is sponsored by Breakthrough Action. And for those of you who are not already familiar with Breakthrough Action, it's a cooperative agreement funded by the United States Agency for International Development to lead their social and behavior change programming around the world. Breakthrough Action is a partnership led by the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs in collaboration with Save the Children, Think Place, Ideas 42, Camber Collective, International Center for Research on Women, and Viamo. It began in July 2017 and is currently in its fifth year of implementation. And since 2017, we have worked in over 42 countries. Next slide, please. At this time, I am very pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Telesfor Cabore, who will provide us with an overview of social accountability. Dr. Cabore is an expert in community health, civil society, and community capacity strengthening with a focus on maternal, newborn, and child health, HIV AIDS, nutrition, and education. He has over 25 years of experience providing leadership in community mobilization and community health program management. Dr. Cabaret currently serves as the lead advisor for community health under Breakthrough Action, representing Save the Children in the consortium. In this role, he serves as Save the Children portfolio director, providing technical leadership and oversight for project management in over 15 countries across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Dr. Cabaret, over to you, and thank you. Thank you very much, Danette. Thank you. Next slide. Yeah, thank you to, to you all for making the time for, for this webinar. To, today's presentation is part of a, a webinar series. Maybe some of you have already participated in the, in the previous one, but it's based on the work that we conducted last year and that this work led to the development of these two products that I'm sharing, that you're seeing in your screen. The first one being an, a technical report on how to intentionally incorporate social determinant of health into social and behavior change. And the second one uh, being a, a tool for expanding the S of the social and behavior change into SBC programming. So, we had following this work last year, we have scheduled to have three webinars this year. And today is the, the third one that we are having. And the last one, the first webinar focused on why do we need to elevate the S in SBC to improve family planning and reproductive health. And the second one was focusing on how can SBC programming address equity and social determinant of health consideration in FP and RIH. So today we are, uh, looking at the same problematic, but with the lens of social accountability. Next slide. So before we dive deep with our panelists, let's bring some precision on some key terminologies that we are going to to be using today. And there are essentially three of them that I would like to share with you. The first one uh, about 
is about social determinant of health. And as you will all recognize, our health is constrained by a range of social and structural factors. These factors include social determinants of health that we can consider as the conditions in the environment we occupy that affect our individual and collective ability to reach our full potential for health and well being. The social determinants of health are categorized in the literature in five key elements. The first one being economic stability, second one deals with education and access to quality education services. The third one, access to quality health services. The fourth, neighborhood and built environment, like the surrounding, the physical environment that surrounds us. And last but not least, element of the social determinants that you'll find in the literature is really about social context and community context. The second key terminology is health equity that we define here as the absence of unfair and avoidable or remediable differences in health among population groups defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically. So this is the definition from the WHO. And last but not least, um, it's important also to talk about social and behavior change given the, 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 the way the concept has evolved over time. And throughout the conversation that we are having today, we'll be defining SBC as the systematic application of participatory theory based and research driven processes and strategies to address change in behavioral and social level, including the cross cutting use of community engagement and strategic communication. So this is an internal definition of save the children, but breakthrough action does use the same definition as well. Next slide. Now let's take a, a closer look at some of the social accountability interventions that we can find in the out there in the in our planet and our practice. They are usually used to support citizens' participation in dialogue with service providers and other officials. They are also they tend to work through uh, existing platforms such as the local community uh, oversight committees, you know, participatory planning and budgeting um, at subnational unit level, national level, you know, national advocacy efforts and, and legal accountability frameworks. The key element here is to remember that social accountability application goes beyond the health sector. And actually, historically, uh, it has been something that was really started with the democracy and government, uh, democracy and governance uh, sectors and practitioners. And then later on, the health sector kind of borrowed from that. They're also expected, I mean, the social accountability intervention are also expected to lead to changes in how community members and providers engage in demand and supply for services of course for health or like you can easily see that it's applicable to other sectors as well. And finally, as you can see above, the goal of social accountability is to develop collaborative relationship to improve quality of service provision and ultimately stimulating engagement of citizens and responsiveness of public and private authorities and institutions. Next slide. So I would like to take a look and, and share with you various session, social accountability tools and approaches based on different purposes, like, you know, based on the purpose, what kind of tools and approaches um, you, can, you can use in order to achieve what you set out to do. Um, it, here we are organizing it in three different purposes that I would like to go quickly with you. For example, if your intent is to increase transparency. So therefore, you would be looking at tools such as patient charters or budget literacy campaign, public advocacy announcements and public hearings and so on. However, if your aim or you are set out to strengthen participation, to strengthen communities' voices, tools 
like facility exit interviews, user committees, participating in quality improvement or partnership defined quality or the community action cycle would be approaches that you will be looking to utilize. And if your aim is really to increase data utilization for our decision making using, you know, through more routine monitoring and so on, social audits, you know, public expenditure tracking surveys or the community scorecard, community feedback loops would be the, the type of tools and approaches that you would be using. And in any case, whatever tools you will be using, you know, find its application, as I said earlier, rather through demo for democracy and governance sake or advocacy or improving service delivery, quality of service delivery or health system strengthening, in particular for the health uh, finance and the government block of the, the WHO building blocks. And of course, data for decision-making and community action planning. Next slide. Um, before I pass the baton to the, our panelists, I, I wanted to share also with you the, some information about results. Um, what we are expecting from social accountability intervention is usually you know, improvement in quality services delivery, responsiveness of providers and policymakers to citizens' demand, enhance the voice and empowerment of marginalized group. Uh, another expected result is the reduction in corruption or better governance and policy design, and ultimately really achieving the right and, and, and achieving better health and developmental outcomes. So thanks to Antje uh, who conducted a lit review, we, we, I would like to share with you some few key results that we, we found out there. Um, the first one is in Mexico where budget analysis and advocacy activities by national civil society organization increased funds for implementation of adolescent sexual and reproductive health and rights policy. In Uganda, for example, a community scorecard program implemented by a group of civil society organization resulted in 33% decline under five mortality. This is published by World Bank. And in Peru, increased rates and timeliness of health seeking behavior and decreased maternal death was achieved after four years of client charters for maternal rights implementation. An analysis of 50 programs and other meta analysis of social accountability program conducted, concluded that a strategic approach that employs both citizen voices and policy, government policy strengthening and, and enforcement is necessary to achieve improved service delivery at scale. So it's about really using both, but not focusing in one element. Next slide. In summary, uh, what research found is that there are gaps and challenges in the application of social accountability interventions. First, social accountability is more than just the rollout of tools. That is why it is important to have clarity on the purpose or why are we implementing social accountability. And second, the process matters. It is really important to let it take its due course and not shorten it for the sake of time. And there is no one size fits all. There is a need to tailor the intervention based, of course, on the context in which we are working. Finally, uh, if it, it's, it's important to retain that one major challenge that undermine effective implementation is really the lack of capacity or the poor commitment in design. And of course, the insufficient community participation. Next slide. So, Let's continue this conversation. We will have a chance, of course, as um, Danette said, to listen to the panelists debating some key questions about social accountability. And we hopefully uh, plan to have you also intervene through questions uh, once they have finished to address the questions that we prepared for them. So I would like at this stage then to 
introduce Rachel Taylor, my colleague who is going to monitor the, to, to moderate this uh, panel discussion. Um, then she will take it from there. It's my pleasure to introduce Rachel Taylor, who will moderate our panel discussion today. Rachel serves as Senior Advisor, Health System Strengthening at Save the Children US, where she focuses on improving health equity and strengthening community health systems, including their two USAID Global Health Awards, the Local Health System Sustainability LHSS and, Moment, and Momentum Country and Global Leadership project. Rachel has over 20 years of experience supporting MNH and health system strengthening program. She began her public health career at a, as a community clinic in Los Angeles, California, where she learned the value of communication, trust, and accountability between community members and healthcare providers. Rachel, please, over to you. Thank you so much, Telesphor, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining today. Um, I'm really honored to be facilitating a conversation uh, with such an illustrious panel, um, and I will now introduce you to each of our four panelists. Um, next slide, there you go. First, uh, from Malawi, we have Helen Wale, who is currently an independent consultant in leadership and change management. Previously, Helen served as community health director and advisor uh, with 30 years of experience in evidence-based community health, community engagement, governance, accountability, and health system strengthening approaches, um, including using the community scorecard to generate participation, dialogue, and to improve relationships between service users and service providers. Helen has worked with Project Hope, World Vision Malawi, Fawima, Malawi Red Cross, Save the Children Malawi and Management Sciences for Health. So welcome to Helen. Also in Malawi, we have Tumbiko Msiska, who is a public health practitioner heading CARES Community Scorecard Consulting Group, which is a social enterprise that's been established to amplify the impact and scale of the community scorecard tool in Malawi and beyond. Tumbiko was part of the team that first developed the community scorecard with CARE back in 2002. So we are very grateful to have his participation today. Moving over to Tanzania, we have Alice Monyo, who is a social scientist with 15 years of experience in health policy and budget analysis, evidence-based advocacy, community engagement, governance and accountability, and strengthening of health systems and structures. Alice works with Sikika as a director of programs, and Sikika is a Tanzanian NGO that works to influence uh, the provision of quality health services for all. Welcome to Alice. And last but not least, in Uganda, we have Dr. Peter Weiswa, who is an associate professor at Makerere University School of Public Health. He is also a visiting researcher at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Uh, Peter is currently a member of the WHO Advisory Board for Maternal, Newborn, Child, and Adolescent Health, and he's the founder and coordinator of the Makerere University uh, Maternal and Newborn Center of Excellence. Dr. Weiswa is also involved in many community health programs in Uganda, and we're grateful for your participation today as well, Peter. So before I turn over to our panelists, I want to let our participants know that we have uh, a couple of prepared questions um, that I will be asking of our panelists. And as in the course of our discussion, as you're listening and as you think of questions, we invite you please to use the Q and A feature of the Zoom um, to ask your questions. And we will do our best to answer as many of them as possible as time permits. Um, we have now 32 minutes for the session um, before we hit our closing marks. So I will start with our first question, and please do use that Q&A feature to pose your own. All right, so turning to colleagues in Malawi first, uh, Helen and Tumbiko, um, can you share with us, please, in what situations do you think that social accountability approaches, approaches are most useful and why? Over to you. Thank, thank you.
Thank you, Rachel. Go ahead, um, please. Yes. And you're muted, Tumbiko. Sorry, we have your video now, but we don't hear you. <laughs> My apologies, technology. First, I should have. <laughs> it's an honor indeed for me to be here and uh, uh, be part of this panel. And I'm looking forward to sharing and learning more uh, with you all. So, social accountability, we've used it quite uh, uh, a lot. Uh, from where I'm working, uh, being a consulting group that provides technical assistance to others, we've been involved in designing uh, programs. Uh, social accountability programs are uh, specifically using the Pontius Cocard uh, in Africa, Asia, as well as in Latin America. But the key example I want to share with you here is uh, uh, a situation where uh, public health indicators or maternal health indicators specifically and family planning uh, were not performing okay in Malawi. The unfortunate thing is that uh, there was huge resource investment in the health sector. Uh, interventions were being implemented, but the indicators never improved at all. So social accountability was brought in as a way of facilitating the engagement uh, between duty bearers and uh, service users. And in this case, when you look at service users, we're also considering the most marginalized groups. And these are people that usually don't participate in conversations. Now being part of the conversations, interrogating what are the challenges uh, in the sector that are leading to perpetual uh, poor performance of indicators. And that allowed perspective of the communities as well as the perspective of service providers as they do a detailed diagnostic of the issues to come up with joint action plans. And these joint action plans would be implemented together between the service providers and the service, service users. And we noted that uh, uh, indeed, as, uh, 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 as my colleague already shared, that social accountability is not a solution on its own. It has to be aligned with others and it has to be strategically embedded uh, in the context in which you're operating. So the escalation, there were some issues that at local level that would be solved at local level, but there were others that uh, would require engagement of higher level decision makers like policy makers. So building in like the community scorecard allowed that continual, that linkage between the local level and the higher level. And uh, identification of solutions, which eventually the two sides were able to hold each other to account to ensure that implementation is done in the most effective way possible. And this led to one increase in uptake of services, secondly, satisfaction of our services uh, from the uh, service users. They said the services were now better than before. And because of that, it triggered their interest even to uh, use more of the services. In a nutshell, that's what I can share, but maybe Helen would want to add one or two points. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also honored to be part of this panel. As my colleague has already said, I think the most approach that we have used here is the community scorecard. But in addition of that, uh, we have actually discovered that in community, especially rural communities where services have not been uh, performing according to the indicators. There are several reasons why. Some of the reasons are because uh, there are no facilities in those rural areas. But during the uh, interaction with the communities and the, with the service providers at health center level, it has actually seen that in those areas where there were increased number of home deliveries, and the probably leading to maternal death, we discovered that community members did not know their role as such. But during the interaction and the dialoguing sessions that we were conducting during the group discussions, they were able to realize that they have the potential to demand for services. And they also realized that they have a part to play so that they can be able to achieve the health indicators in their communities. This has led actually to the communities participating and some of the communities actually had to construct some of the structures where services could be offered in the rural areas. 
they could construct a, a, a temporary structure and later on they could do a mold bricks and then come up with a, a, a permanent building. And because of that, we have seen even the uh, other partners like government stakeholders, NGOs supporting with iron sheets and cement so that it has been a joint effort. That's why we felt that the social accountability approaches are very useful if the approach, especially the community scorecard approach is taken into poor communities where facilities or services are not there. And the other thing is that we have actually seen that because of the approach that Malawi has been using in most of the rural areas, the communities are able to demand for specific activities that they want to be performed than just general health services. They are able to say, no, I think in our community, we realize that there are a lot of maternal deaths or we realize that family planning is not being implemented. So what we need here is we want a facility that can be able to give us those services. And because of that, we have actually seen a lot of changes and a lot of increase in the social accountability by both service users and the service providers. I think that's what I can beef up with what Tundiko has already said. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Helen and Tumbiko, for those rich examples from Malawi. Um, I'll turn now to Peter and Alice. Um, Peter in Uganda, Alice in Tanzania, with the following question. Um, how do you see social accountability approaches relating to equity and with what effects? I don't know which one of you would like to start first. Alice, maybe you can go first. Thank you. You're muted, Alice. Thank you. As implementers, we uh, implement uh, these uh, social accountability interventions, aim at uh, ensuring everyone has access to uh, quality health services. And that's uh, not only the equality, but the equity part comes in. And uh, uh, sometimes during this uh, uh, discussion, which uh, Helen as well as uh, uh, Tumbiko has mentioned, you find that there are several, several gaps that are associated with what, uh, why the uh, either service users are not uh, accessing the services or sometimes why the service providers are not providing. I may give an example of uh, uh, intervention on social accountability on family planning we did in uh, one of the region in, in the country, Tanzania. And uh, first, the uh, family planning uh, provisions in Tanzania are free, means the services, the commodities are free. However, we found out the communities are not accessing these, uh, these services for a number of reasons, as uh, we understand the issues around the norms, the attitudes around the, which comes with family planning. But uh, in reference to the equity, we found this community uh, not accessing this, uh, not accessing these services simply be, uh, due to the geographical location where the facilities is and where the community lives a quiet uh, distance. And they, may, they need uh, either a transport, the fare to come to the clinic, or it may take them a day to, because there's only one bus coming to the uh, to town. And uh, during the discussion, it was found that they, they, we can uh, have a solution. They came up with a solution rather than this, uh, 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 waiting for this to come. Why not uh, starting the mobile clinic? And that was the solution which were discussed during this meeting. The community use uh, members, the service provider, and they were agreed that they will be able to, uh, to access this service if at all the service provider will come to, the, uh, to their community. And uh, during the uh, implementation time, we saw there was increase of the uh, access to from this community. So despite that, if uh, 
family planning is, is free in the country, but there are some uh, barriers which hinder uh, communities to access these services. And to ensure that everyone has the access and ensure the equity when it comes to services, the, this uh, social accountability helps to identify these barriers and as well as identify the solution, which can be, uh, you know, within the, 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 the resource, within the resources of the facilities, within uh, their communities, to ensure that everyone has access to the to the to the facility uh, to the services. Another example is uh, with regard to to young people in the same field, uh, as well as men. It was observed that they, they, during the, this uh, focus group discussion that men as well as young people uh, well, we are not accessing these uh, family planning services. And uh, some of the, of the reasons being that men work in that community compare, they go to uh, usual I mean, uh, businesses or are employed and they cannot take off to go to the clinics as well as the uh, young people. Young people go to school or some are going there doing business. And uh, during the day, it's very, uh, it's not, they may not get time to assess these services. However, they propose to the community, what to the service provider, what if you add an hour or two on certain days where after school or after work, we can access uh, family planning services. And uh, we found that there were, the men who came increase in terms of number uh, coming to the, to the clinics. It was uh, they increased the one day during the week as well as few hours on Saturday, and Saturdays and uh, during that time it was uh, the clinics were or oh, were, were closed. But because it was a demand from the from the uh, communities, then they opened for few hours on Saturday to ensure that uh, young people who by being in school during the day or during the week may not be able to access these services. So those are kind of example we think the social accountability. Uh, in influence issues around equity when it comes to sales provisions. Thank you so much, Alice. Over to you, Peter. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so in terms of social accountability and equity, uh, as you know, equity is when there are unfair or avoidable differences among the health of the population based on uh, like certain considerations, geographical, racial, social. And social accountability, I think, is built uh, ideally to bridge these gaps because then you can exert pressure to the system to be able to respond so that um, these gaps are bridged. Uh, but one of the challenges is that these same um, areas that uh, are so inequitable, I mean, that are suffering from uh, these avoidable differences. Sometimes there are also those areas that uh, are weakest, hard to reach, poor socioeconomic status, and they may not have the capacity to exert demand or to uh, operationalize social accountability. Otherwise, there would be the money, for instance, if they don't have a hospital in their setting or they don't have a certain service, then these are groups that are left out that should be uh, using social accountability to demand. So to do so, you need definitely to be in the know that you know this is your entitlement. You need to have good data and good systems for communication. And uh, sometimes to be able to break these gaps uh, so that um, inequity, inequity is bridged, uh, you might need to be helped, uh, for instance, by CSOs. I'll give, for example, in Uganda, uh, there is actually a group, they use, it, they use the law to actually uh, exercise social accountability among us, the group of lawyers who work with civil society. They are called SEHAT, Center for Human Rights and, and, and Health. What they do, sometimes they actually sue the government uh, using the right to health as uh, an issue. In fact, I could tell you, we went to court here. Uh, I, was, I, gave, I was a technical expert. Uh, when they were suing government on issues of maternal death, that why should women be, die simply because they are poor and the government is not providing services, yet there is a right to health. So they went up to the Constitution Court and interestingly, uh, the Constitution Court ruled that yes, uh, the women should be getting good care, 
and have a right to receiving good health and the government should provide these services and the very government should be reporting to uh, parliament, but also to court on the progress they have made. Uh, recent also when, when the budget for health was going down, these same lawyers also did the same, went to court. They also went to court during COVID, trying to say private providers are so expensive and yet people have the right to health care. So to bridge these gaps, I think, uh, for especially communities that are left behind, they may need to be helped by AG, CSOs, or even the media, and us also researchers, because if we do good analysis of data to show that there are differences in health in certain populations, then that is an important thing. And for, for us with Makere, we are working with actually the countdown team around maternal, newborn, and child health, trying to analyze what is the progress of the country towards the SDGs and which populations are being left being left out. And we use that to engage with government uh, so that they are able to respond, but also give the same information to the media and civil society. So those are some of the ex examples of how social accountability can help bridge uh, issues related to inequity in healthcare. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter, for, for bringing in some other elements to this discussion um, around equity, um, sort of multi-sectoral action, I think, to support social accountability um, and, you know, needing to know who is being left out, um, who is not receiving equitable uh, quality of care, equitable access um, in order to address those inequities. Um, I think I will, I'm going to turn now to our next question, which actually overlaps a bit with a very good question posed in the Q&A. So, um, our next question is around, or sorry, no, that was the next to next question. Let me go to that one. I'm going to change things up a little bit here um, because I think this question in the chat is really important, um, which relates to as a colleague asking about measurement. Um, so how do we know the social accountability approaches? I was just muted by the host. Sorry about that. Um, how do we know that social accountability approaches are successful? This gets to the measurement question, which uh, was raised in the chat, and I know is one that um, many folks have dealt with over the years. So how do we know these, these approaches are successful? Um, and I think we'll start first with uh, Helen or Tumbiko from Malawi. Would one of you like to take uh, a response to that question? No, th thank you so much for that question. And indeed, that's a, a varied practitioner's question uh, that we usually uh, been encountering when you're doing the social accountability work. And uh, even from the genesis of the community scorecard, that was the question that people were asking about. Uh, because people would tell positive stories, anecdotal stories about uh, the impact of the approach. That indeed, since we started using the approach, we've seen an increase in the uh, uh, quality of services being delivered. Uh, the health workers are going to the, I mean, opening the facility on timely manner, and the people are equitably uh, being uh, attended to. So those are nice stories, but I think the question still remained scientifically, do we have any proof that indeed social accountability works or not? So a case we have uh, from Malawi, we did a randomized control trial, uh, which looked at uh, identifying 10 health centers uh, as interventional, where we implemented the scorecard approach, and we also turn as control. And we looked at the uh, uh, various parameters in the areas of uh, PMTCT, family planning, and the uh, MNH. The outcomes at the end of it from an randomized control trial, it shows a great distinction between the interventional facilities and the control facilities we saw a huge increase in the uptake of modern family planning methods by over an increase by over 57% uh, uh, in controls uh, in, in interventional facilities compared to the control side. And that was the difference in the times, I mean, difference uh, between the two areas and between the uh, baseline assessment and the endline assessment. So to me, I think that's a key demonstration that indeed this approach, I mean, uh, social accountability can indeed be impactful. And in addition to that, 
We've also looked at the uh, trends in the uh, indicators that the government are uh, uh, monitoring. So in the areas where we've applied social accountability, we've seen even increase uh, in the allocation of resources, increase in drug availability, because there's somebody always checking on how the system is performing. Just like Peter said, uh, the people that are watching over and it's taking pressure. So that has led to in quite a number of changes demonstrable uh, in looking at the uh, conventional indicators that the, the HMS systems are actually monitoring. And probably the third thing is the experiences. Experiences on the ground have indeed demonstrated that this approach really works. So I leave it to Helen just to showcase some of the examples uh, from the practical point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tumbiko. Yeah, uh, as Tumbiko has already said, I think I'll not talk much about what he has said, but I want to talk about what is happening on the ground. Uh, the application of social accountability approaches using the community scorecard has actually seen the uptake of services by community members. The community members have actually integrated the services, not just on health issues. They have gone beyond health issues because now they realize that they have a role to play in interventions at ground level. As such, we have seen in some of the communities that instead of just looking at health facilities and the accessibility to health, they have gone beyond that. They have even integrated agriculture where they are making some vegetables and sell them and support uh, poor families so that the poor families should also access, access nutri nutritious uh, food at community level which will still relate to health issues. And we have also seen that there are some communities where they have gone beyond that. They are able to mobilize resources and then follow up on the girl child who he cannot be able to afford his or her education. So what they have done is they have mobilized resources at community level and they are supporting some of the girl children to go and attend their education. Apart from that, the communities have mobilized themselves even to follow up on a girl child who have dropped out from school and then they send them back to school by discussing with the families and even with the other party that actually had to uh, take this young girl for marriage. They have actually done a lot and we have a lot of evidence which is happening at community level where we have seen that the communities have now understood their role and have integrated the health issues into other interventions, which I felt is one of the biggest achievement that social accountability has brought to community members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen and Tumbiko for those, those examples. Uh, Professor, <laughs> we want to turn to you to answer this question. Your uh, 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 I'm glad uh, our colleagues in Malawi have done a uh, randomized control trial. I think the answer is uh, it is not necessarily a very easy thing to always know because all the time you are not able to do another CT randomized control trial most of the time, but it's good that they've been able to do one. We actually also did the randomized control trial. We had a project with UNICEF and Gates called Quotes. Uh, where we wanted to ask the question, uh, does the use of data um, uh, and evidence at district level improve child health? And the part of the packages that we used was social accountability, where we had CSOs and community groups trying to help communities exert uh, social accountability. So we're able to measure it as part of a package. But it was not always easy actually to scale out social accountability, even through CSOs, because usually in, in the communities, many CSOs that are there are designed to do service delivery. They are not like uh, on the side of uh, uh, demanding for uh, performance. And many times they are benefiting from government. So sometimes they have a conflict of interest. So community groups uh, were important, but difficult to do. Now, there, but have you said that that's difficult to know whether it is working? I think there are several ways, there are several things you can do. 
we can move from as simple studies uh, of what we call observation studies to more uh, complex one like experimental uh, studies. Another city is an example of an experiment study. So you can, you can see participation of uh, community members in two key decisions. You can see hear voices when people are given a voice. When people are being consulted uh, as part of regular policy making and programming, then you know that the social accountability happening. And of course, you can make attempts to measure. You can measure participation through surveys. You can do other self-assessment where people see whether they actually are having a voice. And then, of course, you can also ob uh, do observation studies with, where you, you observe if you have initiated like a community group or participatory group, if uh, there's something they are trying to push for, if they succeed and you can have case studies. So there are several methodologies you, you can employ, but you need to be more intentional and more innovative in the, uh, studying this. Thank you. I uh, also maybe in the courts as to what we did, we had communities also try to assess their participation and the, uh, most, of, most of the methods they use to see whether it's working, we are participatory, they would draw what things uh, they want and what, ch what changes they are making or they have seen in the communities. So I think the answer is you need to be more intentional and also to be more innovative. Thank you so much, Peter, for that. Uh, we have five minutes remaining um, for our panelists to share their experiences. And I think what I'll do, I know there are several questions in the Q&A function. Um, I will ask our panelists as they are able to um, type some answers there. I know that Peter has responded to the question about what was the outcome of the legal action. Um, so if you're not speaking, uh, panelists, if you're able to, um, kindly provide some written feedback to some of these questions if you're able to. Um, then I will move on to, um, okay, and I'm receiving some guidance from others in the chat. About, okay, great. So I, what I'd like to do now is ask you a question that's not on our list. It's coming from the audience. Uh, we wanna give them at least one opportunity here. So um, how do you think social accountability approaches differ uh, from other participatory engagement approaches that SBC traditionally uses in its programming. So from your individual experiences in your context, how do you see those as different? And may I suggest, um, let's see, Alice, would you like to try that one? Uh, thank you, Rachel. Let me try and my colleagues uh, will, uh, other panelists will add. Uh, I would say maybe there might be similarities with these uh, approaches, different approaches. However, with social accountability approaches, we found the, the, this uh, respons responsiveness of the, uh, of the youth bearers. And I think that is a unique about social accountability. Uh, with others, uh, SBC's approaches, yes, there is a, they also focus on uh, behavioral change, social change, so do the social accountability, but there's not much emphasis on uh, uh, responsiveness of duty bearers. And for me, I will take that as one of the, uh, although they are similar, but there's this uniqueness when it comes to, uh, with the social accountability, the approach can lead to make a, uh, duty bearers and health management teams and anyone involved in the supply uh, chain to be able to respond, to be able to, to be accountable. The, the, the accountability issue comes in whereby the SBC approaches yeah, the influence on the change, the behavioral change, the uptake of service or individual change, as well as the social and community change but there's not much on the uh, responsiveness, not much emphasis on the accountability part. Great, thank you, Alice. Uh, Malawi colleagues, you look ready to go, please. Yes, uh, I, I also wanted to say, I think there's a, there's a difference 
The difference comes in because in social accountability, actually the uh, vulnerable groups have a voice. And because they have a voice, they can demand for what they want. And apart from demanding, they also participate. So they become active participants in decision making and even in, in, in the implementation of what they want at a um, uh, community level, than imposing the, the interventions on the community. So they are able to say, no, we don't want this, but we want this. And because they have that power to say, we want this, they are able even to monitor the activities that are happening. And they're also able to monitor even the services at a uh, facility level where they are able to sit and see where the changes have taken place after they had to put their actions, uh, plan of actions. And then they also come back and assess whether and evaluate whether what they planned is being implemented, which I felt is more than what the other approaches are doing. Thank you very much, Helen. Peter. No, no, I think uh, the, I think Jasmine has said, I think the main thing is, um, well, as it is increasingly becoming part of SBC, it was never designed to be so much uh, SBC itself. Uh, it is, uh, in my opinion, it's more complementary and facilitative to SBC. Remember SBC is a lot about uh, like health promotion and stuff like behavior change and issues like that. Whereas social accountability is sometimes trying to uh, demand, uh, ensure uh, more access and stuff like that. And I think though that complements uh, SBC. So it's increasingly becoming, I think, part of, but it's especially as a complement to SBC, in my opinion. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter. And I apologize, but we are at time for the panel. Uh, thank you very, very much to Tumbiko, Helen, Alice, and Peter for your time and sharing your experiences today. I will turn it now over to, I believe, Telesphore or Danette to close us out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we go to the next slide, please? Oops, no, so, sorry, the, the one before. <laughs> yes, um, we, are really, we are really at the end of the session today and we would like to really thank you all for your participation. As we are wrapping up this session, you will see a survey pop up at some point uh, in your screen. And we would be really glad if you can take time to answer the question that our communication team is asking you for the evaluation purposes. Next slide. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to share with you this list of uh, useful resources that again, thanks to Auntie while she was doing the lit review, we're able to come up with. And, um, but I want to really point out um, a couple of them in particular, the one um, you will see it, I think it's the first one uh, published by the rescue, you know, you will see in the website, the first bullet point related to, to social accountability case studies. It's a very important one as it presents really a variety of approaches and um, uh, tools that are being used or utilized uh, worldwide. Um, another one that is also important, is the one uh, with the HERD project, social accountability retrieved on May 19, 2000, 2022. This one, uh, focuses on measuring social accountability and health outcomes. It's a very important, you know, in relation to the question that was asked in the, in the panel. So you will find some answers there as well. And then the, the last, but you know, document that I would like to point out or flag for you is 
the again related to the herd project but talking about reporting checklists so it's a checklist that um, social accountability practitioners could use as they, they report on their and their interventions so next slide it continues the reference list really continues you have a second list of uh, we don't have to go through all of them but um, on your own time please take a look at uh, those useful resources um, I also next slide please I also want to invite uh, you all to stay engaged in the conversation by participating in an online discussion board hosted on Springboard. So Springboard is an online community of social and behavior change SBC professionals who are passionate about making a difference in the world members. In the world, members seek access to subject matter experts, latest tools and resources and stimulating discussions and educational opportunities in order to advance their own knowledge and skills. You are welcome to participate in the online discussion board in English and or in French and feel free to invite others to join in as well. So my colleague Danette will add links in the chat box for, for those of you who are interested. Next slide. So once again, thank you so much for taking the time to join the conversation today. Thank you to our panelists. We don't take your participation for granted. We know that you, you left multiple you know, activities in your routine days to join this conversation. Please, uh, we're very grateful and receive our thanks for that. We hope to welcome you again in future webinars on other topics, but until then, we really thank you and uh, have a good rest of your day, evening from wherever you are joining this conversation. Thank you so much. <laughs>